Welcome to the Point of Difference Rugby League Podcast. I'm your host, Dave, and today we're going back in the day with one of the UK's finest. He's an absolute sensation. He certainly knew his way to the trial line. It's the one and only Martin Chariots of Fire. How are you, man? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's a Sunday evening here, just having a little bit of chill time before all the mayhem starts on Monday tomorrow. <laughs> absolutely man um thanks so much for coming on the show it's an absolute privilege to have you now what's the great martin O'Fire been up to in recent times oh i've been retired um over 20 years now about 22 years um which seems to have flown by uh i have been on a, a host of reality tv shows as i said i think there's only probably about two big reality tv shows in this country i haven't done um uh, it all started off, I think, back in the 90s when I was on Gladiators. And then wow. um, just after I retired, I did um, a show called Strictly Come Dancing, which is probably the biggest reality TV show probably uh, in this country. Um, I think they call it Dancing with the Stars in New Zealand. Um, yep. uh, yeah, so a host of reality TV shows. And more recently, I've um, been you know, coaching my two boys, uh, my oldest, Tyler's, Eight turned 18, and he's a professional rugby player now, playing rugby union down at Bath, made his uh, pro debut uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, yeah, also more recently, I've been <clears throat> transitioned into the business world, working as a brand ambassador and investor in several different companies, uh, uh, one in, in the uh, sustainability field called Connected Curb, which is an electric vehicle charging infrastructure company, you know, the, the road to... Um, to net zero and the decarbonisation of transport. I'm an EV driver myself, so we're trying to smooth over the transition to electric vehicles because we have a cut-off date for the sale of uh, ICE vehicles, that's internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, by 2035, you can't buy petrol, diesel anymore. So uh, by then, everyone's going to have to be driving electric vehicles. So obviously, not everyone's got a, a home charging uh, facilities. You know, if they live in a block of flats or a terrace house. So yep. they need charging infrastructure. So I'm very, very big with that. I've just bought out a sports mattress with a, a company called the Romantica Beds. And I'm also a brand ambassador for the Wigan Warriors. So I've been with them for a couple of years. Going to go up to Vegas um, uh, in uh, in March 2025 to play a Super League game uh, yep. with um, the Warrington Wolves. And I know there'll be a few NRL teams out there as well. And uh, I think uh, the English women's team are playing against, uh, is it the Gillaroos, is that they call them? Yeah, <laughs> that's the, the one. Female, <laughs> <laughs> the female kangaroos. <laughs> yeah, Mate, the Warriors will be there, the New Zealand Warriors, they'll be playing the Canberra Raiders uh, on that weekend, yeah. so that'll be Penrith, a pretty big one. Penrith out there yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, Penrith out there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be massive, man. Massive. It's so good. <laughs> right, so um, let's rewind the clock a bit, man. Uh, where did you grow up? What was life like for a young Martin O'Fire? Uh, what was life like for a young mind of fire? Um, um, pretty um, crazy upbringing in the sense that um, you know, spent a lot of time outside. Um, you know, there was no computers or social media or phones back then. You had to make your own entertainment, and you know, for me, it was sport. Um, during the summer, you know, I'd spend all day with my brother playing cricket. You know, we'd sit down and watch a test match for five days, and uh, when they went for for lunch and tea, <laughs> then we'd go and play outside. So, yeah, a lot of playing football. Uh, I didn't discover rugby until the age of 11. My parents sent me to a boarding school which didn't have a football team. Um, I thought they didn't love me. Uh, sending me away to, to school and, uh, you know, the school didn't have a football team, but they were very big on education. My dad was a, uh, a barrister. My mum was a school teacher. So, you know, wow. they were very much about education. Um, but, you know, I... Uh, all I wanted to do was run around. I was probably the most academic child, but in, enjoyed playing sport. And when I went to boarding school, uh, I got to uh, experience some, a lot of new sports. I said rugby, also fencing, um, cricket I'd already played. And uh, badminton was another sport. Yeah, so it was really an, an active child. Loved being active, loved sport. And um, yeah, just loved life, really. Yeah, man. So good back in the days when we all just played sport as kids. We were glued to the the old phones and the Xboxes and all that stuff back then. So you're a very active child. So um, I actually um, I heard that you weren't the fastest runner in your family. 
uh, actually, it took you a while to beat your brothers, uh, you know, growing up. Yes. Um, my dad, uh, even though he was an academic, um, uh, I found out later in life that um, as well as, um, you know, he, he wrote books and, and as I said, I did a lot of reading, um, read a, a book which had a, a fantastic effect on my life called uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, uh, he, as I say, was a great footballer and a great track athlete. But as I say, okay. I had two older siblings, a, a sister and a brother, Nina and Chaik, uh, who were both faster than me. I didn't win a single race uh, in my whole childhood. Um, the first time I beat my brother, I think, I must have been about 22 or, or 23. And I'd just come back from starring for Great Britain in the, um, in the 1988 uh, Great Britain Lions uh, tour. Uh, you wow. know, I think I'd scored in New Zealand, scored in, in the, um, the second and third test against Australia. And then I came back to England and said, OK, Chuck, let's give you a race. And that was probably the first race I actually won. And both my brother and sister like to remind me that they were both faster than me as children. But that's why I say in life, never give up. You never know why you're going to, you're ready. you know, it wasn't only Leo the Ryan who beat me in a race. It was my brother. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, you've never lived that down, have you? <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I've won a lot of races in my life, but people like to remind me of the times that, that I didn't um, win. I always say that's, you know, when you know you're successful in life, is when everyone reminds you of the times that you, uh, you know, you, you lost a race, or yeah. you, you didn't score a try. And there's so many players, and now I'm in airports around the world, and people come up to me, and they tell me about times and games I didn't score in, and, you know, times I didn't score, and I was like, I just put myself... It's like going out in the rain, you're going to get wet. You know, if you play rugby, you're not going to score every game, even though I yeah. did uh, manage to score in uh, more more games than I, <laughs> than I, than I played in. So I, know, I didn't that's do too bad. ridiculous. That's crazy. What a stat. It's such a good stat. So you came through, you played a bit of rugby union. You sort of, you played in the sevens for uh, England, I believe. And, um, you know, and then, so how did all that play out? And was that the sport you thought you'd chosen to play for your career? Um, when I left school, um, I went to play cricket because cricket was a professional sport. So a guy called Ray, who was a spin bowler for Essex, took me down there and uh, my uh, uh, claim to fame was that I bowled out Graham Gooch in the net. So I always reminded him. Oh, wow. Because it wasn't bowling, wasn't bowling machines back then. So we were talking the summer of 1985 now. And um, I played one second 11 game for Ethics. Uh, it was actually um, a three day game down in Hove against Sussex. And I was rooming with NASA saying, uh, didn't right. get a wicket, didn't get any runs, um, fielded up long on for three days. And it was the most boring three days of my life. And it was, it was tough on the old body as well just fielding and bowling. Uh, <laughs> and I thought to myself, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So I thought yeah. to myself, I'll just go and play rugby and uh, somebody will give me a job because obviously rugby union in the 80s was an amateur sport. Um, played a few um, invitational games and then got picked to play the Penguins in um, in Hong Kong, in the Hong, Hong Kong Sevens in 1987. I was playing at Rosin Park and doing pretty well, uh, scoring some tries and uh, yeah, just out of nowhere. Um, I mean, Hong Kong, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, playing against teams like Western Samoa and, and the All Blacks. There's a picture in my autobiography wow. of me, Hong Kong, with the All Blacks and the likes of Zinzan Brook, Mark Brook Cowden, Terry Wright, uh, Mossy Coloto. Wow. Uh, uh, God, there's was, there was so many of them. And um, uh, yeah, I couldn't, uh, the great Vainga Tuagamala, I call him the precursor yes. to Jonah, Jonah, Jonah Lomu. What a fierce him character he was and I went on to play with him um, you know uh, in the 90s when he came over to play rugby league or the Wigan Warriors and that really just shot me onto the national stage really because I came back to England after playing that game it was on TV on rugby special I think we beat Western Samoa as they were back then in the quarterfinals I scored a couple of tries and then I think we narrowly lost to the All Blacks um, in the in the semi-final and I got picked to play for the Bar Bars I played yes. in the Middlesex Sevens, uh, which was on TV. And then I played in sort of a final England trial. Um, England, uh, sorry, it was London versus the North. I was playing against Rory Underwood. I was the captain of England, Mike Harrison, and another guy called Mark Bailey. So the four okay. of us playing on the wings that day. And I scored two tries that game. Uh, and there's a, there's a picture of me in the paper, handed off Rory Underwood going outside him. And I thought to myself, 
I'm going to get picked for England. I'm going to the World Cup. It didn't happen back then. <laughs> uh, you, you didn't get picked just like that. You know, nowadays you get internet sensations, but I was an internet sensation before the internet. And yeah. uh, it was just word of mouth. And that's how I got the nickname Chariots when I was playing in the Middlesex Sevens in 87 when Swinglow was first signed at Twickenham. And uh, I'm quite proud of that fact. A guy called Colin Wellens, who wrote the, the screenplay to, to the movie Chariots of Fire, told me about that because he was in the crowd that day. And, you know, and that's how yeah. I got the nickname Chariots because, you know, I, I, I'm not like Floyd Mayweather. I, I don't make up my own nicknames. It was bestowed on me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, a guy called um, Doug Lawton saw me playing on TV yes. and um, just came to, to London and, uh, uh, you know, prized me away um, after I was a bit disillusioned, after not getting picked for England and, and thinking, you know, what am I going to do? What's I going to go and play for Wasps? Was I going to go to Bath? Because I felt like an outgrown Rosen Park who I was playing for, the club I was playing for. But, yeah, the opportunity to go and play rugby league, um, came about and, and I thought Dougie was giving me um you know a bit of a spin telling me that he felt that I could become one of the greatest wingers ever to play the sport and I just thought he's just telling me that that's a sign. Um yeah. but when I see Dougie now I saw him recently at a Lions reunion dinner and he just gave me that right r- 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 smile and say, you know, I, I, as if to say I was right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, say, I, I can't complain. Just sag. <laughs> 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 Mate, so what was it um, that appealed to you about crossing over to rugby league? Obviously, Dougie Lawton's in your ear, like giving you all the, you know, the, he's whining and dying again, sweet talk again. But did you know much about rugby league? And like, did you know any of the players in the Super League or anything like that? Would you know what you're walking into? Um, it, was, it was just the old first division, didn't know anything about um, rugby league, really. I'd seen um, rugby league as it used to be uh, shown on BBC One back in the 80s, and it always used to be. For some reason, the whole played honk and hard. It was always in the mud. But I do remember <laughs> seeing one game. It was a Challenge Cup final. And I remember seeing um, Wigan play. And I thought, wow, that looks great. Because, uh, you know, I was a Man United fan. I loved watching football. And the pomp and the pageantry of, of the Challenge Cup final, the colour, you know, it was either blue and white and red and white, um, yep. black and white, you know, the teams. And I just thought, wow, that, that was quite fun. Um, so that kind of stuck in my mind. And uh, I remember after Dougie signed me, I went up to um, the witness uh, to have a look around because I signed the witness before I'd even seen the place, which is probably oh, really? the best idea. <laughs> I, I went up and I remember meeting Andy, Andy Courier and Darren Wright and thinking, wow, these are big boys. They must be forwards and they were both centres. I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> they're pretty big for centres. And then I saw Kurt Sorensen and I thought, Jesus, he got spin. <laughs> I thought, have I made the right thing here to <laughs> switch into. Um, to, to play rugby league and I remember them giving me my kit and I'm thinking why is it all black and white because I, I thought I'd actually signed for Wigan I didn't realise oh, really? I'd signed for Witness yeah, and that's how much I knew about rugby uh, wow. rugby league um, I didn't even know you know but yeah I took it like a duck to water I, I, I didn't score for two games but one of the third game I figured it out I think I, I went on a 15 game uh, uh, try scoring and run and, and wow. That was the first record that I broke. I think I broke the yeah the, the all time consecutive scoring record in you know, my first eighteen games. I think I'd already completed wow. that. And I won the Man of Steel in my first season, topped the try scoring charts. Um, you know, uh, scored a hat trick in the championship decider against St Helens. Uh, wow. Got picked to to play for Great Britain. Went on the the Lions tour and yeah, and then not a bad rookie season. Way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until I got to Australia, and then it was a bit of a baptism, baptism of fire, getting all the press, and te- then you know the Aussie press telling you that you were no good, and yeah, that was uh, yeah, it was a, a bit of a bit of a whirlwind first year. Yeah, man, it was a pretty incredible. Because like, didn't you um, break the the try scoring record for a season for witness with forty two in your first season, like forty two tries, and it's your rookie season. That's crazy. I think it might- I think it might. I think it was. Uh, I think it was forty-two or forty-four, something like that. Yeah, try. Wow. Uh, I think it was Frank, Frank Myler's record. I, I broke my first season. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I just and just kept scoring. Really. I think that I was at Witness for four years, and you know, a stat that I'm proud of that I was uh, the top try scorer in the competition every single year. So four years on the bounce, and I don't think anyone's wow. ever done that. Even the likes of you know the the Billy Boston's and and the Brian Bevans and you know. 
haven't done stuff like that. I think all in all, I think I've, I've topped the try scoring charts and you know six times in the first ten years. I think the other right. four seasons, I think I was I was injured. So yeah, um, yeah. So I, I I had a pretty whirlwind start to to playing rugby league, and um, yeah, it was a good team to be in. You know, the likes of Jonathan Davis and Motik Pelodo. Yeah, um, yeah, the Hume brothers. Um, yeah, it was a, a, a stacked team. Absolutely was. So uh, your form for witness saw you get selected for Great Britain. Well, was your debut against France? Um, and like, I'm pretty sure you scored in your first test as well, you know, sticking to your true form. Yeah, I think I, I scored nearly with my first touch of the game, but um, that's <laughs> when I sort of understood the uh, complexities of sport and that things were, were not simple because I, I made my debut, scored, and then promptly got dropped for the return fixture. So uh, the guy called Dave Flange got um, um, got selected. And I remember watching that game on TV, you know, feeling quite upset because it was at Central Park in front of a packed crowd, and I had to see David Flange play. And I thought, well, maybe I'm not going to, you know, get picked to go on the Lions tour. And I thought, hey ho, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but then Mal Riley, you know, picked me for the for the Lions tour, and um, yeah, I was chuffed about that. Um, I wasn't uh, a keen flyer. Um, really? <laughs> and when I realised that wasn't the best player, but when I realised how many fights there were involved, I thought, geez, I think, I think it was it was in the old days, we had these sort of long tours. It was like nearly 12 weeks because we went to Papua New Guinea, then we went to yep. Australia, then we went to uh, New Zealand. And I think I had to do about 30-something flights up and down. <laughs> I, was, I was close to not going, but I thought, no, my, Martin. Uh, man up, you get the, the chance of a lifetime. You've got to get on that plane. And I did. And it was uh, it was a fantastic tour. I had some fantastic times. Um, yeah, interesting man. times in Papua New Guinea. And then just, you know, <laughs> up and down the country in little planes with propellers all over Australia, uh, which was uh, <laughs> which is interesting and eventful. And then uh, going to uh, New Zealand as well. I think we uh, had two tests. Did we lose one test and, and win one test, I think, in 88? I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. But what's it like, uh, you know, firstly, pulling on the jersey for your country, but then also, you know, hearing your national anthem for sort of the first time. And, you know, what does it mean to you to represent your country, you know, for the first time? And, you know, it must mean a lot. Yeah, it was. You know, uh, from the age of 15, I had it in a, as one of my goals to, um, you know, play rugby for England, obviously that was the rugby union, um, you know, uh, many times in life we have to pivot <laughs> and, um, you know, take a different path and, you know, I, I, I did that when I went to boarding school and I did it again when, um, you know, I switched to rugby league. Uh, when I look back now um, on my career and people say, oh, you know, I'm, you know I go to watch, uh, you know, England play at, Tw at Twickenham or the Alliance Stadium as they call it now. And uh, I was there to see um, England play against Australia, against the Wallabies recently, and you know Suwali was playing, and obviously you know lots of what Jonathan, um, sorry, uh, Jason Robertson have done, and yes. uh, even uh, Jonathan Davis and Andy Farrell, you know they all got to become um, you know cross grade players and become internationals in, in both codes, and, and people yes. say you know don't you wish you could have done that? And I know I'd say, I'd say you're a product of your time. You know there are many players before me. Um, who like, like the likes of Billy Boston's, or uh, uh, you know, who, who, who didn't get to become uh, dual internationals, but you know, they've got other great things. You know, they've got record because you know, you're in league for that length of time. You know, you, you break records if I if I'd played both codes, and then I probably wouldn't have broke all the records that I did. You know, the try scoring records in in rugby league. You know, I probably wouldn't have a statue outside Wembley, and you know, be in the rugby league hall of fame. So. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the career that I've had, you know, the players that I've played with. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful that, um, you know, I managed to stay injury free. And yes. um, because, you know, you, you, you had to do that to be able to, to score a lot of trials. You had to be on the park. So speaking of international games, uh, you said you went to Papua New Guinea. I love asking players about you know, their experiences in Papua New Guinea. There must be a couple of good stories out there um, of your experiences. Oh, God, it was... It, it was crazy, you know. You go around there, they're always uh, chewing that that nut stuff, and it's, it's spitting it all over the band. It's an interesting place, but they are passionate people, passionate about rugby league. Rugby league is like a religion in, in PNG, but yeah, you know, people can have stories about it, it now. And I would say, 
well, imagine what it must have been like going there in the 80s then. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was interesting. Um, it got a bit nervy at times, um, you know, when um, uh, well, people were trying to break into the grounds and, you know, and, and sit in, in, in the trees at the top to try and, you know, look over into the stadium. It was, it was like something in, a, in, I felt like I was in some kind of movie. It was, it was, it wasn't like reality, not like reality that I, I, I've known. And uh, me and Roy Powell, I think with two black players on that tour, and, and there was one time where I think they were just like shaking the boss out of excitement. It was, we were, it was getting quite scary. <laughs> where we kept saying, if uh, if they break in the bus, are we going to take our clothes out and join them and start attacking you guys? So we were just like making light of the situation, but uh, yeah, it was, it was fun times. You know, it's a great honour uh, to represent your country and to go and to go and play anywhere and um, yeah, to play in Port Moresby. It was an experience, you know. Yeah. I just went from, you know, uh, playing rugby union to, you know, having a bit of notoriety playing, uh, you know, in, in Hong Kong and then going up to play in Widnes and, you know, the excitement of the fans then and all the kids used to run on the pitch. But then to go and play in Port Moresby was uh, an, another thing. And, you know, everyone was clamouring for your autograph, clamouring just to touch you, you know, as you were, you know, these people that, you know, come from a far off place and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. It was interesting times, let's say that. Yeah, man. So, so also you uh, you actually had a really pretty good record for compared to a lot of players when it came to beating Australia. I think you had four Test match wins over Australia during your career. Which you know, I've talked to a lot of players who played for New Zealand and you know Great Britain, and there's only one or two you know wins in there through their career. You know, like their scattered wins. But you got four. So what's it like taking on guys like you know Andrew Anyhausen and? Gary Jackson, your Peter Sterlings, your Wally Lewis's, like you, you had some bloody fantastic players you had to get around and you did the job. Yeah, we I just I never lost 3-0 in the series to um to Australia and came exactly. close to winning the Ashes on a couple of times. You know, once I was um uh, on the treatment table, I think it was in 1990, we were literally 30 seconds away from winning the Ashes after wow. you know, winning down in Wembley. And then, uh, you know, I'm on the treatment table because Mal Meninga fell on my knee. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I see Carl Gibson take a dummy from Ricky Stewart. And I was just thinking, if I was on the pitch, there's no way I would have let R Ricky Stewart get that far. And then he gave the pass to Meninga and then, you know, in a death of it. And, uh, you know, that's definitely the one that got away. And that's hard yeah. to take. And then, you know, had some fantastic times. Obviously, um, uh, winning... You know, in Sydney in 88, uh, you know, against the great Wally Lewis, um, having yes. duels in 92 against E.T. I was literally inches away from, you know, literally scoring a worldy try against the, the Kangaroos at the, at the Sydney Football Stadium in 92. Then, yep. uh, thankfully, in um, in the second test down in Melbourne, uh, we exacted our revenge. I think we put yes. the biggest... Um, uh, beating on the kangaroos that they've ever experienced at home, I think, beating by about 30 or points to 10. Yeah, yeah, it was um, a good win. Down in, you know, I mean, that was a good win in there, but we, could, we just couldn't seal the deal. You know, a great, great team, but come so close. But, you know, I've had success in Australia, you know, beating, obviously, the Broncos in in 94 in, uh, in the World Club Challenge, you know, in right. their own backyard, and, and also beating the Broncos in 92 in the, in the Nissan World Sevens. Yes. Um, in that rainy day. Um, so yeah, it's we've had, we've had some some good times uh, in, in Australia. Uh, had, had some losses as well, and you know I had some good times playing in New Zealand as well. Um, but um, I had some bad times as well. I think it was in the third test. I think it was in, in 1990 when I dropped the ball over the line in the third oh, test. Oh no! And uh, <laughs> and I think uh, Gary Schofield never lets me forget that. But I was reminded <laughs> that I scored the winner. Uh, to clinch the series um, two nil uh, the week before, so yeah. Okay, man. So let's um, go back to your witness career. Uh, your second season, you know, you, you unbelievably managed to surpass your first season of forty odd tries. Uh, you you won the premiership and championship. You you scored something like fifty eight tries in your second season. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Like, you know, did you feel like? Uh, you're just on the end of a good back line or, you know, obviously you've got all the talent in the world, but what a team you had, you know, you Phil McKenzie's and Mossy's, Jiffy, Kurt Sorensen, you Phil McKenzie, Andy Currier, like, 
What a side you're playing. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Yeah, and even we had we had Dale Shearer uh, oh, uh, wow. centre for a bit in the in the first season I was there as well. Yeah, so a lot of talented players and I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, you know, I I always say uh, you know, uh, make hay where, where the sun shines and uh, you know I just enjoyed scoring tries and it just became infectious and you know, it became more of a talking point if I didn't score. You know, that's when I knew that I was onto something when they reported in the papers that I didn't score and I thought, and everywhere I went, you know, that was a thing. Supporters were saying, you're not scoring today. So it became this kind of duel that I used to have with, you know, uh, with the spectators opposing fans, you know, that uh, you're not scoring today. Uh, you're not scoring against Arsenal. If I play against players and it was the thing, you know, I wouldn't score. And that's why I had to be all over the, over the park. So, yeah, it became, it became my thing. And, um, yeah, yeah, just kept scoring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly did. So then you, um, the end of uh, the 1989 off-season, you move over to Australia, signing with Eastern Suburbs Roosters. So how did that idea coming about going to Australia and how excited were you about the prospect of, you know, lining up against some of the Australian players? I was over overjoyed to to get the uh, get the call to come over and play in the NRL because uh, I would have went for a cup as it was back then uh, because I we used to get videos um, there used to be a company called Micron Video and okay. uh, we used to go into the video shop every week to get you know the highlights of the win for cup and you see likes of Alfie Langer and Wally Lewis and all these great stars and it was the commentators it was yep. it, um, Graham Hughes and um, just, I just used to think to myself, God, you know, people say, why did you go over there? I said, I just wanted to go over there just to hear them commentate on me because I used to just love the Aussie commentary, the way that oh, I used Jesus to speak. The and, <laughs> and, and I think there's a video on um, on YouTube of me uh, in, from 91 at the Sydney Football Stadium when I'm playing for St George against East and I score a hat-trick and you I did. think Graham Hughes, he calls me a freak. <laughs> and he goes all the way from even the Frank, all the way from England. And I just that I just buzz. Even when I hear that today, you know, if I'm ever yeah. having a bad day, I need to just go and put that little clip on, and it will just make me feel good. You know, I've got so many fantastic memories that that help me get through any dark times I'm going through now. That you know, I've just so loved for it that I've had, so loved playing in Australia, just creating those memories that people remind me of. All the time, I could be the most random, you know, place. I could be in a shop in in London, or I can be, uh, you know, on a plane in Ibiza or something. And somebody will come up to me and just go, "Oh, oh, I just remember you." Or my dad used to love watching you or this, and I remember this game and that, and you know, that would be leaders to me. It's, it's about creating memories for other people and for yourself. You know, that I you know that other people enjoy those memories. You know, it's like works of art. It's just, as I say to people, you know, my, my own children have never seen me play a game of rugby because they weren't alive and they wouldn't sit down and watch, you know, a whole game of me playing rugby <laughs> now. But they've seen so many snippets on social media and on YouTube and you know, what people have posted and what people send to them and what people show them on their phone. And I always say that, um, you know, careers can be forgotten, but moments last forever. And I'm thankful right. that I've created the moments, you know, some that I enjoy, some like, you know, losing to Leo and Ryan in a race, which people like to <laughs> remind me of. Um, <laughs> I also, you know, no one ever talked to me about the race I won because I came over in you 1984. Beat <laughs> I beat Daryl Shearer. I beat Chicka <laughs> Ferguson in a race. Well, not one person. No, is, I only talk about other people about the race. Not one person has ever come up to me and said, Oh, I remember that race when you beat Del Shearer at a dog track and Chicka Ferguson, not one person, but everyone comes up to me and says, oh, I remember that time you lost the race. <laughs> I say, that, I say that's, that's true greatness. When you can do great things, but people will still come up to you and talk about times you didn't score, times you lost the race, I think, well, that, that's when you know you've done something. So I always wind yeah, up Dean Bell uh, yeah. because the day that I scored... The day that I scored 10 tries, I didn't win man the match, right? And Because uh, Dean, Bell, Dean Bell won man of the match. That's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. He, did, he did score a hat-trick and he did um, um, he did play really well that day. If, I, if I'm going to watch a game of rugby, I don't care what code of rugby it is. It could be sevens. It could be, uh, you know, the NRL could be Super League. It could be Super Rugby. 
I can guarantee you, if a player scores 10 tries, he's winning man of the match. I can, I can guarantee you. Even if they're, even if they're 10 put-downs. But if you can, it's only a great player, and there's a, only a great player can score 10, 10 tries and not win in a match. It'll take a John That's alone. It'll crazy. take someone great to do that because everyone, because I've scored so many times, people just took it for granted. You know what I mean? I'd score five tries, I think, in the semi final of a Challenge Cup uh, against Bradford. Didn't win man of the match. Didn't he, you know, John Money didn't even try a good game. John Money literally said to me, and this is no word of a lie, he said to me, Martin, apart from those five tries, you didn't do much else. And I thought he was joking. But he wasn't. <laughs> John Money was a hard pass, Martin. Thanks, John. I, was, in a, uh, uh, I remember seeing, uh, uh, I didn't get it at the time, but I remember seeing him interviewed a couple of years after I left Wigan. And he said his, you know, his coaching um, strategy was when players did something well, he didn't, you know, uh, you know, pat them on the back because they didn't need it. They were, you know, up and up already. What he did was focus on the things that didn't do well. So I didn't realise that's what he was doing because I came from a coach at Witness, Doug Lawton, who was like a father figure to me. He just, yep. you know, patted me on the back and, you know, he used to say things like, if we're losing in a game and there's two, you know, five minutes left, he'd go, well, Martin hasn't scored yet, so we're still in this game because Martin right. scores every week. When I hear stuff like that, that's his, you know, because that's why I realised that in life, different people have different strategies and different psychologies. And it's all yes. about getting the result, and that is winning and getting you to score. But they come at it through different directions. And I didn't understand yes. things like that. So I'm used to having that kind of father figure. So when I got to Wigan, it was, it was a bit different. You know, don't get me wrong, it worked, because I always still wanted to succeed. And, and people talk about, you know, pressure and all stuff like that. And I told them that, you know, I went for witness to Wigan. They paid, I think, £440,000 to get oh, me no. to, to Wigan. Right. And they'd Crazy. already run the Challenge Cup. They'd already won the Challenge Cup four years on the bounce. Yep. And they just sold Ellery Hanley, arguably the greatest player ever to play the game, for a quarter of a million. So I say, that's pressure. <laughs> that's pressure. <laughs> that is pressure. <laughs> Well, I wanted to, I, but people said, are you under pressure? I'm like, how can I be under pressure? I want to score any, every game anyway. You know, I come from yeah. witness where I've been the top try scorer for four years on the top. So if you're scoring every game anyway, it's like, you know, so I played half a season. I think I'd, I, you know, I didn't do it all by myself. I did have a guy called Gene Miles playing inside me. Handy. Um, <laughs> <It's really> handy. <laughs> handy. I think I did a... Uh, a bit of a, a video message for him. He's on the on the footy show on the uh, with uh, Angie Johns uh, a couple of years ago, and um, uh, they, they were doing a bit of a segment that you know had I bought the beer for you know set me up for all those tries. So I had to do a message to G Miles, and I remember after Morris Lindsay told me that he wasn't coming back because I only played for half a season with G Miles, but yeah. when um, Morris Lindsay told me he wasn't coming back, I, I literally burst into tears. Really, with all due respect, they got a guy called Andrew Farrer. Uh, yep. Andy. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, we, did, we didn't quite gel quite the same as as um, as, as I did with Gino, and um, yeah. So ninety three, I'd come. I think I had a bit of a shoulder dislocation. It wasn't the greatest season for me, and and then that's when the pressure was on because um, uh, even Wigan fans were, you know, saying, you know, we sold him for, we bought him for this money. And, um, you know, we've got Jason Robinson on, on one wing and we've got Vaiga Tugamala. And, uh, you know, I'd come back from a shoulder injury and wasn't doing that great. But um, thankfully, a guy called Sean Edwards, who was, uh, as everyone knows, is a great coach, you know, he sat me down and had a few words with me and got me back on track and managed to get my place back. And, um, yeah, back in the Wigan team for 94 and uh, had a, a pretty good season, which culminated, obviously, in the... Um, Scoring that try at Wembley, which is probably the thing yeah. that I'm going to be uh, the moment that I'm going to be remembered for most. That's the one against Leeds. Is that that length of the field, absolute ripper. Yeah, yeah man. So talk yeah. us through that try. I was going to ask you about that because, like, wow, what goes through your mind? You, you know, you're on your own ten meter line. You break through, and then you've got the fullback to be. It looks like you're going to cut back inside, and then you just do them for pace on the outside. Like, do you remember that whole moment? 
Yes, um, yes, but sometimes it takes me. I have to meditate sometimes to get into the moment because I've, that is the most sh sh probably the most shown rugby league try ever. Uh, yeah. You know, in the world, I, I would I, I would say arguably, um, you know, since nineteen ninety four, it's been shown on TV every single year over here <laughs> on the BBC. Every time the Challenge Cup comes around, every time I do a reality TV show, you know, the, the, the clicks that it's got on social media. And uh, yeah, uh, so I've seen it more from the point of view of watching it than yes. putting myself back into that moment, uh, you know, going up against Alan Tate, who was a, a teammate of uh, mine. And if anyone goes onto my um, Instagram feed, they'll see this, the number one story posted to the top is the newspaper article I woke up to, I think the day before that Wembley game, because obviously I've been going through some troubles, as I mentioned in 93, with the shoulder yeah. dislocation. I just kept in my shoulder in my second season, uh, my sorry, my second stint for Eastern um, Suburbs in 93, playing against Penrith at Penrith Stadium. And um, um, yes, uh, just getting my shoulder there, I had to come back, rehab it, having tough times. Uh, yeah. So a guy called Alex Murphy wrote, wrote a story and I've kept that story. I, the day I was walking around Wembley, I, I, I had that story in my blazer pocket as I was walking around. And it said uh, that I'm finished and I was the best of a bad bunch. A guy called Alex really? Murphy, who's arguably one of the greats of rugby league, you know, played for St. Helens, coached, um, you know, Keeve at Lee and Warrington and Wigan you know, and, and such. Sort. And it's a great figure uh, within the sport. But he wrote, that's one thing I thought, said to myself, when I finished... Um, you know, and if I write stuff in the paper, I'm always going to try and be positive. I'm never going to do that, even though I do thank him because maybe without that motivation, you know, yeah. I wouldn't have scored that try. Well, you know, because I just thought to myself, imagine if I do something amazing, if I could prove that guy wrong. It just reminded me of the times when I was at Browns in my early career and, you know, I'd get racially abused and people call me a blacklist or that or that. Oh, wow. I always try and think to myself, God, if I could really score an amazing try now and look that, and I'd look that person who said that thing about me in the eye and had that connection with them, you know, I just thought that is, to me, that meant so much. It put so much, I don't know what, it just put so much in me, that fire in me, that I'd created something positive out of something negative. You know, they say, yeah, if life absolutely. gives you lemons, make lemonade. That's what I always have tried to do. And that's what happened to me that day at Wembley. So... Wow. Say if anyone wants to go look at the story, just go to my Instagram feed. It's it's pinned the number one story on my page, and it's Alex Murphy. And Alex Murphy is now one of the guys who is um, on the statue with me. So me and now and Alex Murphy, full circle, are going to be together forever. And I see Alex Murphy, and I've not mentioned it to him. It's kind of the elephant in the room when okay. I see him now. But I have, I have no animosity towards him. It's only love because you know he elevated me. Right in that story, imagine that. And it's now, you know, rugby league, you know, it's a massive sport in, you know, down under, you know, with the NRL and, you know, you've got the Warriors and you've got, you know, you know, Penrith doing what the amazing things they, yeah. they've done. But still, in this country, you know, it's Union is still the number one sport. And so for a rugby league player to get national prominence, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's massive. You know, I, that's what I do as an ambassador now. I'm, I'm, I go around and I beat the drum for you know, what Matty Pete has achieved, you know, winning so much, or what uh, Bevan French has achieved. Bevan French yes. has been man of the match, the World Club Challenge, you know, the Grand Final, the Challenge Cup Final, you know what I mean? And he should have been man of steel as well. He should yeah. have been man of steel. Can you believe, in this fantastic season, Bevan French didn't win man of steel, and Matty Pete did not win coach of the year. Yet, you know, Matty Pete, Matty Pete has been, has been just awarded by the journalists of the country, the whole journalist of the country um, has been awarded Coach of the Year. And that's why I say sometimes, which uh, I think, I don't want to say it's a knock on the sport, but I want to say we don't champion ourselves as much as we should, how much of a great sport it is, and especially in the UK. In, 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 in Australia, they do, and that's why the sport is so big. And, um, you know, that's why I'm a great historian. I love to to read about the history of, of, of rugby leagues. I knew I came into rugby leagues as a, as a novice. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know yeah. we just played in black and white. That's how little I know. <laughs> I love that, I, uh, Ryan Brevin, how many, you know, he's called 700 and whatever tries about Billy Boston, about Roy Francis, about 
even Alex Murphy to tell me things about me because I, I like to know about you know the, the history of the sport and how how brave it is and to know did you know that in 1966 when England won the football World Cup when they beat um, Germany at Wembley in that same year there were more people at the 1966 Challenge Cup final that stuff I didn't Amaz know stuff. that's amazing <laughs> yeah. Amazing stat. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to get these messages out there because that's what I was doing back in the 90s. And people say, well, why are you remembered by people? Because I said, I was communicating with, doesn't matter whether you're a rugby league fan, doesn't matter whether you are a sports fan, doesn't matter. If you're watching TV and I'm playing, you know, that's going to, you're going to communicate with everyone. If you see a guy pick up the ball inside his own, you know, 22, it goes and scores yeah. a length and, and it's a packed yeah. stadium and everyone goes wild. That's crazy it's, good. It's, watch, you know, when I see it and, and uh, you know, well, sometimes you need to get the, the message out out there and when, you know, when I when I managed to, um, you know, because I was a kid from London, you know what I mean? I was a black guy from London playing rugby league. So that's the human interest story. So people are going to be interested in that. So I managed to get on the front page of this newspaper because Alex Murphy, Murphy wrote a story about me, but it was a negative story saying I'm finished. But I saw the opportunity and I thought to myself, God, because I'd had four years playing at Witness where, where I didn't get to the Challenge Cup final and I wanted to. Yeah. I won World Club Challenges against the Canberra Raiders. I played in yeah, Australia. Man. I played at Wembley against Australia. I scored against the Kangaroos at Wembley. I scored you know, I played at Old Trafford. I've done all these great friends, but I did not play in the Challenge Cup final. And then in 92, I did, and I won the last Todd. But, you know, I didn't think I'd create a memory. You know, people don't got to me, go, oh, I remember the time you played in 92. Or in 93, when I played against my old club winters, where I got yeah, elbowed by, by my old teammate, Rich, Richie Ayres, and got knocked out. So when 94 came around, and, I, and that story was written about me in the paper, I'm thinking... Wow, imagine if I did something amazing here. That's why people always ask me, why did you go to your knees? And I say, I have never done that celebration before or after. I've scored 501 rugby league tries all over the world. I've never done that celebration before. I've never done it after. But it was just, I was in the moment. So when you say to me, what was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. I was just being. Like yep. I say to my son now, and I give him advice about scoring tries, and I say to him, they're trying to become a Jedi, yeah? And they say, how do you become a Jedi? You become a Jedi by doing something so much that you just, you just be. You're not thinking about being. You're just, be, you're just in the moment. And you're doing the right things. You're, you're systematically programming yourself. But when that moment comes around, you don't need to think. You just be. And that's what I did in that moment. And so I just think my whole, it's almost like my whole career was, you know, just everything happened. So, to be at that moment, at that time, for the story, you know what I mean? It's like everything I've done, the injury, the this, the getting signed for all that money, scoring all those tries, uh, having the down times, the up times, you know, even what happened in my life, not, not winning a, a race from a whole childhood, everything seemed to point to that day. And, yep. when I, you know, and that final bit, the final bit was, you know, reading that story about me. In the national paper, so I'm thinking to myself, everyone who's bought a newspaper has seen that. And now I'm on BBC One. This was back in the days where we only had four channels. There's not yeah. like Sky, Netflix, this, <laughs> that, that, that. There's only four uh, channels. Three yeah. channels. Or how many of them? And this is the Challenge Cup final. Everyone's watching it. Everyone's, people are waking up in, in the middle of the night in Australia, New Zealand to watch this game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because People told me, you know, oh, that's what we do. You know, it's, it's, it's a thing we do every year. We get up, you know, we watch the Challenge Cup final. You know, people like Brett Kenny play, you know, Sterling, yeah. you know, all that. It was great. So I'm thinking, this is your time now to do that. And you've got the greatest backdrop because somebody's written a negative story about you. Yeah. What about if I could, could go and do something? So to actually go out and do that, it was just... And to go around my old teammate, Alan Tate, and I'd known, I'd played against... And with Alan Tate so many times. And I knew he's a great fullback. But I just knew what he did. He just showed people the outside. But I just thought to myself, you know, it's like playing, he was playing checkers and I was playing chess. I was one move ahead of him. Because I'm right. thinking to myself, I'm faster than you. So I knew what he does. He shows people the outside and then he just mows them down because he's got the angle. But I'm thinking, if I go inside and then you go that way, it's like, and I think I did the, the same thing against um, 
uh, Gary Mercer. I think it was a Gary Mercer at um, Old Trafford, I think uh, a couple of years before, when okay. I did in, in, in and out. And it's like, I'm going in and out, but then it's like having a race with somebody, but you saying go. If you race against somebody, and that, I remember that from my childhood, if you race against somebody, and one of you has to, whoever the guy who says go, is going to win. And that's what, basically, <laughs> yeah. that's what Lee Odom did to me. <laughs> if you hear Lee Odom, I think basically, he, he cheated because he uh, his um uh, the guy who started the race they practiced when uh, when they, you know they go on your marks get set and they timed it so he'd know when to say go so basically that's, basically, that's what I did to Alan Tate I went inside and outside and when I'm ready to go that way I go and then you've got to catch me so I've got to jump on him yeah. that's what I did so when I'm doing all that and it, everything on the big occasion it works out yeah. I just it blew my mind it literally blew my mind in that moment so I just literally went down to my knees and put my head in my hands because I wanted to, to block out the 85,000 people that are there and just have my moment. That moment was for me, you know, yeah. everything I've been through for then it was, I think, Andy Farrell and Phil Clark come on and said to me, look, Mark, we haven't won this game yet because we was under pressure and that was just the first floor. We've got the whole game to go. And all I kept yeah. thinking of the whole game is we have to win this game because I'm very much about creating moments, but you create moments to help your team win. Scoring yeah. 50 tries and your team loses is pointless. I always yeah. say to myself, I think that's why I scored so many tries. Because if I never scored a hat trick and my team lost, I always think to myself, God, man, if I'd only had scored four, if I'd only scored four, we'd have won. If I'd scored four tries and we lose, I'd have gone, God, if only, if only we'd have scored five, I'd have won. And that's what was in me. You know, I was like, this is what I can do to help the team win. Because people would say, it's tough. So I'd say, no, that's what I can do to help, you know, team win. You know what I mean? If it's that, that's what you do. If you're, you know, if you're a, a you know, uh, you know, a benefactor of a club, you're putting as much money as in. You, what are you bringing to the party? Are you bringing money? Are you bringing enthusiasm? Are you bringing your knowledge as a CEO? Are you bringing your bulk as a, you know, are you bringing your work rate? What are you bringing to help your team win? And I'm thinking, I can score tries. And this is the game yeah. about scoring tries. If, if we, you know, if, 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 if I can score, if I can score five tries, chances are we're going to win the game. If I can yeah. score a try, if I can score a try, which nobody else can score, that's going to give my team an edge. If I can get over, because I'm saying, you know what I mean, if someone else didn't, you know, and they didn't put that in, and that's why I scored it, and uh, I think a decent try in the second half as well. Unfortunately, one, fortunately one man in the match as well that day. It was, it was a moment, but it would only be a moment if we win. Yeah. You can't get caught up in, in, in yourself. It's about how can you help the team, and, and I never... I never lost sight of that, and you know, fortunately for me, it all it all worked out. And uh, I think I had a, a a moment this year as well when I managed to um, I think on I don't know what anniversary it was, but it's a four, or so it's uh, is it the thirtieth anniversary. Uh, I, I got to hand uh, you know be the guest of honor at Wembley this year and hand over the um, the Challenge Cup to Liam Farrell, and that yeah. was even more nervous. So again, I'm thinking my whole life is to this moment and the and I felt myself handing over the cup. So me handing over the cup to Warrington just would not have, you know, no. I'm very much about manifesting, putting your energies into something and trying to make it happen. And sometimes when things are outside of your control, like winning the game is outside of your control, you can score as many tries as you like. You can score 20 tries. You can still lose if the other team scores 21. But you've just got to do your best and see where the chips lie. And on that day, it happened for me. And as I say, I literally was, I could not believe it. And I had a moment to myself. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, it, it makes me emotional when I think about that, what I went through and all, everything, yeah. And that was the pinnacle of my career. But, you know, it was bittersweet because I knew that there was nothing else I could ever do in my life, really, um, that was going to match that moment. As an individual moment, for, yeah, you can get married, you can have kids, and I can see my son do great things now. But from a personal moment of you by yourself, yeah. a moment in front of 80,000 people, but for five or 10 seconds, it was just me. And the memory, it was almost like I was burning the memory of what I'd done <clears throat> into my psyche. Um, yeah, because I, I, I believe that, 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 as I say, that would probably be the, the moment that I think about when I take my last breath, because I think it was a moment that meant so much to other people. And even if I wanted to, to bring something else in, yeah, it, it, it is, it is that moment.
That's an incredible try, man. Like, wow, thank you so much for that. You know, I had no idea there was so much behind that try and that moment. It's just actually incredible to to hear that story and like the motivation and how special it was. And to have that moment to yourself and to celebrate the way you did the crowd going crazy, your teammates coming, but you're just there on your knees in that moment, just reflecting probably on what you've just done and realizing just how much it meant. That's absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that, man. That's that's so cool. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it is. And to, to so many years later, because I knew that it meant so much to me and to Wigan fans, but I didn't know that it was going to mean so much, you know, to the wider sporting public. And, you know, it, when the new Wembley Stadium opened in 2008, there's a bar. It's not named after me. It's named after the try. It's called the, oh, the bar wow. called, at Wembley Stadium. If anyone ever goes to Wembley Stadium, you can go and have a drink at my bar. It's called the 1994 bar. And yep. it's named after that try. <laughs> so it's not named after me. And then I've got, <laughs> obviously got the statue outside. And that just, just cements what, what it means. You know, you've entered, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the wider sporting psyche. And then, you know, you, you see it mentioned on, you know, you're watching random quiz shows and stuff like that. And then, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it does cool, bring man. a smile to your Absolutely. Now you mentioned you uh you played in a couple of World Club Challenge finals. You you got one uh, a win over the the nineteen eighty nine Premiership Raiders side. You know when you played for Witness, and you also beat the nineteen ninety three Brisbane Broncos Premiership side. Uh, two of the greatest sides of you know the Winfield Cup era, and you uh, managed to get wins over both of them. So what's it like taking on your your Mal Meningas and guys like Ellen Lang and Steve Renoff, like these are guys who match you in so many ways, you know, for pace. Like like Steve Renoff's unbelievable, right? Like you two would have a, a great day out together on the footy field. Yeah, it was uh, we did lose in the 92 World Club Challenge. I'll I will put that one in there. Very true. We lost them, <laughs> yeah, came over to uh play us at Central Park. But yeah, had two wins in World Club Challenges. Obviously, Wigan also. Um, you know, beat Penrith back in the, the day ninety one at, um, at Anfield, and obviously beat them beat Penrith again you know, th this year. Um, so yeah, that's the, you know playing against Aussie sides. That's the ultimate challenge. You know, I loved it. You know, yeah. and playing playing against Australian teams in Australia, you can't get any better than that. But yeah, you know, to play against that Canberra Raiders side, you know, Laurie Daly, uh, God, Mal Meninga, Ricky Stewart. Um, so good. Uh, God, it was. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, we were we were twelve nil down as well. I yeah, love you were. So I think life is about stories. It's about stories. If we'd have just gone and blown them off the park, it wouldn't have been such a great story. But to be twelve nil down after twelve minutes, and then to come yep. back and think I scored two tries, you got two. Went yep. up in that game as well. Um, yeah, just you know, just to play on the other side, you know, and to play against. I loved playing against great players and doing great things. You know. Like to, to score tries like that and to go out for people like Gary Belcher and you yeah. know, when I played at Wembley to be to have to Henry Halley on the other side. You know, those are things because those just it's moments, but that's when you step up, you really do find some out find something about yourself. It's easy to, you know, score five tries against a you know, a bottom team and uh, you expect to beat them, but the times where it means most is when you're called, you know, uh, when well, you just call it BGT, big game time. Those times yeah, when, you know, if you're the guy who's earning the big bucks, if you're the guy that everyone's talking about, if you're the guy that people are going to be talking about in years to come, these are the times you have to prove it. You know, it's Challenge Cup finals, it's grand finals, it's test matches. It's the, those are the times, you know, the legacy games, the games that you play in that will be remembered throughout the ages that people will be telling their grandchildren about that, you know, people be talking about when you're no longer alive. And that's, if you're thinking at that level in the moment, that's when you know you're going to create things because it's bigger than winning and losing. You know, my career now is not about winning and losing. You know, I mean, even the 501 trial, it's still a backdrop. <laughs> it's, still, yeah. it's still just the way of getting you in the conversation. It's like, it just justifies you to get in the conversation. But that's not really what excites people. What excites people is the, is the memories, isn't it? It's the emotions, it's the stories. And that's what I do now. I tell stories about my career. I tell stories about the you know the great Wigan team that I played in. I tell stories yeah. about the great Wigan team of today. And um, you know, as I say, it's a fantastic team. It's an honor and a privilege to be involved with the Wigan Warriors. You know, Wigan is a town. 
is um is, is a great town you know they've had some great players have come up from australia like so chica ferguson uh brett kenny as as well well you oh, know well, to yeah. play against great players is an honor you know and to say you know i remember the first time i'd ever like playing rugby and i'd ask somebody you know, who's the best player in the world and they said oh i think it's some guy from australia called wally and where yeah. I was from in London, if you called me a Wally, that was a derogatory term. Right, right. Wally. So I couldn't believe that the greatest player in the world was a guy called Wally Lewis. And then when I got to play with him, I was just like, wow, this is Wally Lewis. Imagine if I could score, try the game playing against Wally Lewis. That, it was amazing. I remember, and one of my greatest memories is playing in the third test against Australia, and I didn't even score, the, I, sc I think I scored a try in the, in the game, but I remember late on, a guy called Mike Gregory, the late great Mike Gregory, who's no longer yes. with us anymore, who was captain captain, uh, captain the Great Britain on many occasions, he scored a length of the field try, and I, it, I, it should have been my try, but Wally Lewis is holding my jersey, and then a <laughs> shot of Wally Lewis holding me as, uh, as, <laughs> as he is the, uh, the Great Britain, Britain player, is Mike Gregory is going to score the try, and to this day, that is an honor that Wally Lewis saw fit to hold my jersey and that's <laughs> in the clip. You know, things like that. You know, people, you, you, you've scored all these tries, and that's one of your greatest memories. I'm thinking, yes, because it's an interaction with one of the greatest players ever to play ever. this game. You know, I told you, yes. Al Meninga fell on my knee, and when I get up in the morning, sometimes it's cold, it's six o'clock, it's dark, I feel that knee. And I think it was so hard because it was like my minis my I stepped problems with my meniscus because uh, I had to go and have a clean out of my knee. And I think that's the knee that Mal Meninga fell on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's my mind is a crazy so way to cool. think, but I think, when, I think, you know, so I think well, I'll take that, you know, it's, it's a pain, but I'll take that. It's Mal Meninga that fell on that knee, even though he did fall <laughs> on it and we, you know, ended up us losing the ashes. And if he hadn't fell on it, then, um, you know, Great Britain would have won the ashes and I'd, uh, Go down even more in the uh, yeah. you know, rugby league folklore because I've been part of the, the last team to win the Ashes. So, yes, you know, I always say glass half full, not glass half empty. Don't talk about all the fish that got away. Talk about the fish that you caught when I caught quite a few in my career. So I'm, I'm happy with that. But it, it was great, you know, those battles with Andrew Ettenhausen as well, the first yeah. Test 92 stadium. I'm not even sure if I was in touch, even in the 95 World Cup. Um, I think is it. Uh, I think he was giving me a bit of stick on Facebook a couple of years ago. Is it Timmy Brasher? Because uh, when he kind of got, got me in touch as well, you know, against I was just that close against Australia so many times. So you know? close. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that I was in. I'm, I'm sure that I got the ball. I think I definitely got the ball in to and, and uh, Paul Newlove scored, but they didn't have uh, video referees back in the no. day, so they couldn't go back and shot. But I think you can get somebody to to go and look at the 95 Rugby League World Cup and to see the the, the break I made from dummy half, inside my own half, went outside, of course, his name is now, the second row where he scores all the tries with the scrum caps play for Manly. Um, oh, Steve Menzies. Went outside him. Menzies, that's it. Went outside Steve Menzies. And then I think Timmy Brasher tried to push him to touch. And I'm sure that I was I brought the ball inside to uh, Paul Nula when he scored. And, you know, again, you always, you try to... Think about those ones that got away. What you're saying, uh, I have too many to uh, there's too many positive memories and say yeah. 92 when I it was slightly a bit of a forward pass off of uh, Gary Scofield, <laughs> but you know <laughs> that's one that went for me. Um, you win some, you lose some, mate. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. But yeah, yeah. Never, never lost a test series against the Kiwi, so even though no. I did drop the ball over the line, and somebody told me that I was on a on a TV commercial back in the 90s in um, or 80s in New Zealand, the Minty's commercial. They used to have a oh, commercial really? at times like the these. Commercial. Need, they used to, at times like these, you need Minty's or something like that. Yeah, yeah, they were like, like bloopers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And apparently, I was one of the bloopers because I dropped the ball oh, over the line against Kiwis. Oh, lost. I, I, I've never seen it, but I've just been told. People would say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm on TV in Australia, I'm on TV and whatever, this, yeah. Uh, uh, people is like, you know, will send me a on social media message. Oh, you was on TV in Australia today about you know, something that I did or whatever. But yeah, I got to try find that. Uh, <laughs> my, my claim to fame in, uh, in, in New Zealand, I was on a Minty's commercial. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> like, we love those Mendes commercials. Like they have good ones of people like shocking goal kick, att- you know, attempts and things like that. You know, yeah, like, <laughs> dropping, dropping the ball over the line and things like that. yeah, great stuff, great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you had you said you had many great battles against the Kiwis. Um, was there anyone you enjoyed coming up against New Zealand? Like I know the the Kiwis came over in '93. The jersey I'm wearing today for a tour of Britain and France, and you guys got the Test series victory. Um, I had my mate Aaron Whitaker playing halfback that day, and I think he said he went to tackle you at one point, and he tried to tackle you, but you were gone. Like, <laughs> by the time he made the tackle, you just disappeared. <laughs> I just remember it was all—it was the big thing in um, uh, in New Zealand. Was, was it when we came over in nineteen? When Matthew Rich um, um, left the All Blacks in time for Manly, ninety-two. 92, I think it was, it was those early 90s that Matthew Rich came over it, and you guys came over. Yeah, for I think it might be 90, I think it might, yeah, it might have been when we came over. Was it 90? Did we come over in 1990? Oh, more than likely. There was quite a few series back then. Yeah, yeah. But I uh, just remember playing against Matthew Rich because he was the, the big star then. And uh, I think I, I can't remember what, what was it, Mount Smart or whatever. But, yeah. Yeah. Took great pride. I think, I, I think it's, it's, on, it's on one of my clips on. Um, Instagram, where I um, think Daryl Powell gives me a pass, and I think I go straight up the middle, get the ball just in my own half, and I think I go just uh, yeah, get, get round Ridgey and, and score a try. That's, okay. that's one of my favourite plays as well. And so, so I always love doing things against great players. You know, if someone's a great player, I always yeah. want to think, want to test myself and see how I go against yeah. them. You know, and um, yeah, he was uh, he was a brilliant fullback. So you did well. <laughs> yeah. Good, great, great goal kicker as well. Oh yes, hundred percent great goal kicker, man. So uh, you 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 must have won just about everything uh, at Wigan. You had like four Challenge Cup victories. You you, you won like how many premierships? Five. <laughs> you know, you won John Player Special Trophy, or and you won like the Premiership Trophy. You won everything, right? So you get to the end of yeah. your Wigan career, and you're moving on to is it the London Broncos you went to? So how did all that come about? And uh, you know, what was the decision to return um, to London? Right. Um, it was something that I always thought about because I'm from London, so I always thought in the future that's somewhere that I could end up, you know, go full circle and come back home. And, you know, because I always thought to myself, after I retire, I probably, you know, was probably not going to see myself as living in Wigan. I always thought, you know, I want to get into TV, I want to get into media. So, you know, London, that's where it's going to be more like to happen. Um, Wigan, you know, there's not many people that can say this or many clubs can can, can say this, but you know, we we had too much. We won too much. We won because everyone's tried to be successful, but we had so much success that we had so much success that we went were going out of our sport to um, uh, you know find things to do. In the you know, there's not many clubs do. You know, look at Penrith Panthers now. Right? How many times yeah. have Penrith won? The, how many times have Penrith, Penrith won the the, the, the Premiership? Uh, I could tell you they've five, won four times six. About, well, they've won times. four in a row now four. and two others. Yeah. That's four in a row. So they've won four in a row, yeah? Yet again, they won't come over to play Wigan. I know, it's crazy. Before. You know what I mean? They won't come over to play Wigan before, um, um, you know, going to, to Vegas. They said we can't fit in our schedule. In 1992, which was my first year, in the season, we went to Australia – Played in the Nissan Sevens at the Singapore Stadium. Won, came back, played a important um, Challenge Cup game against Warrington. Won that, and then went on to because we know we had to to risk it to to go out just winning premierships, premiership like St Helens. St Helens have won four premierships on the bounce. No one in England outside of the sport of rugby league knows that St Helens have done that. Yeah, if yeah. you want to push outside the boundaries, you have to create a story, something which excites people. And St. Helens winning, they could go and win as many championships as St. George won, 11. No one's going to remember that. You have to do something incredible. And that's what we were doing. We were going and playing rugby union. We went and won the middle sex. Imagine this, the first Super League season, right? The reason why Wigan lost the first Super League season, we lost it on points difference. I think the first, we didn't win the first Super League season. Uh, we came okay. second St. Helens, right? In that in that season, we played um, the Bath 
at on a Wednesday night at Rugby League at Main Road in front of 50,000 people. We then yep. also, a couple of weeks later, went down to Twickenham, the first rugby league team to play against a rugby union team. We played rugby union at Twickenham against Bath. And then we're also competing in the Middlesex Sevens against Wasps, Leicester. Really? Uh, yeah. And, um, Crazy. Harlequins. Harlequins playing their top teams against Lawrence Lalio, Andy Gomesol, all part of the future 2003 World Cup winner in the first yep. Super League season. And then we go and lose the first Super League season on points difference to St Helens. And that's what I love about Wigan. Okay, they're a club, and what they have to do that because they're saying we need to go out to the world, we need to go out to the world, and that's why Wigan is remembered. And people um, go, Yeah, and the brand because they're doing things, they're breaking out of it, they're taking risks, right? And people, and if we just stayed in our shell, we would have won, been the first Super League champions without doubt. If we'd have focused on it in games, we were like people like Henry Paul were getting injured. We, yeah, it's just ridiculous. We, end, we ended up with like 11 men. On the Wednesday night game, playing Bath. Yes, right. we needed the money and to get those things, you know, to do those things. That obviously, you know, it brought a lot of finances into the club. But it just just us again winning another Premiership, winning another, uh, you know, Challenge Cup. They won eight on the they won eight Challenge Cups on the bounce. It's I know, like crazy. I got I I literally scored so many tries. I <laughs> got to the stage, and I remember having this conversation with Sean Edwards saying. If I score another try, does anybody really care? That's how many. That's it blows my mind when I say that now, and that's what yeah. I say. Say, God, we had so much success that I thought to myself, you know what? Do I? If I score another try, does anyone care? Don't care. I scored five hundred and one tries. It's like, if I scored five hundred and forty-five, would my life be any different? I don't think so. Probably not. Well, it would have been different if I if I it, it, I'd scored so many. It's like once you get to four hundred and fifty, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It's like you've scored that many. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want to score hundred. Yeah, yeah, make two hundred. Yeah, three hundred, four hundred. It's just a four. It's like we had so much success, and you know, we just kept winning and winning and winning. So we had to go and look outside of our sport to to try and grow the brand, to try and do things to get people. You know, in nineteen ninety four, we won the team of the year. One of the few teams ever to win team of the year in the whole country, you know, because we did some incredible things. And we just had to go and push the envelope even more. And that's why we were going and doing playing against the rugby union teams. And I just felt it was a bit small, I don't know if it's the small minor is the right word, but just when um Penrith said they're not gonna come over, I just thought maybe it's because the sport is so big over there and there's so much um at stake. You know, financially for the club, that's why they wouldn't do it. Well, even if they'd sent a team over, their second team over, it would have been better for them because, you know, you're growing the brand, you're going out there, you're yeah. risking it, you're stepping outside. But, you know, I'd love to have a conversation and understand why the Premier Panthers wouldn't do that. It was when the Wigan teams that I was part of, you know, I know Chris Radlinski recently in a in a uh, interview said that, you know, if if it was, uh, you know, we could go to the Magic Weekend, we'd go there and play. You know, you just yeah. have that foresight and that, and that's why I say Wigan are the greatest rugby league team in the history of the world because they've done things which no other team would have done and they succeeded in doing it. Okay. I mean, they've gone to Australia, they've gone to, in the middle of the season, going to play in Australia, in the, you know, against, and the Broncos are their top team out, you know what I mean? It's like, it wasn't, they weren't sending putting their second team out of the top team that we went out there with our best and we, we competed and, and we won yeah, right. we came back and we still managed to win our challenge cup we felt you know because we had a, a, a guy at the helm he was a guy called Morris Lindsay who had the foresight to spend a lot of money to get me to the club you know where yeah. a lot of people we said no, I'm not that stupid why was that even now we're talking about Bateman and how much he's this and that even now if a and this is 2024 if a club spent £440,000 on a player, any player, a winger... That's a lot. People go, oh, a lot of money. Just for a transfer fee, not for his wages, just for a transfer fee. So and this was the 90s when it really happened. You know? You'd have that foresight, and that's because that's what, that's what the winging club was about. They're like, we have to, whatever we have to do, we have to have the best we're in it. We've got to go for it, you know? And then we've got to go out and we've got to do it. And there's pressure on it, but as I say it wasn't pressure for me because I wanted to score. I wanted to score. I'm going to do my best to score anyway because that's what I wanted to do. 
So I didn't really see it as pressure. And I had great players, players around me, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's built in us. It, it, it's, it, it's the club. It's Wigan, you know, and that's why I love this club so much, and I'm, and I'm glad to be part of it still. Yeah, man. So is that like, like what you're saying, like, if, would anyone care if you scored another hundred tries or whatever at Wigan? Is that why you went to no London? Cares. Because people might care if you're scoring at another club, you know, where it's a bit no, harder. Maybe. Because, because, because then I started a good friend of mine. Um, a, a girl called Louise was in a band. She she just brought out a record. She had a whole life ahead of her, and she died. She got run over, and I just thought to myself, that was a moment, and that was in 1995. So that's when I started to thought to myself, God, you know, there's got to be more to life. If I just keep scoring tries and I die tomorrow, that's no life. It's like if I, if I scored a million tries, that's it's the, that's the other side of success, which is not a lot. Of people get to that level of success where you actually start questioning your success and you know we've had so much of it you know other things in life you know there's you know enjoying your life you know whether that's drinking whether that's going out socializing with your friends i've never been on a holiday the first lad's holiday like my son is 18 now he's been on like two lads holidays with his mates or whatever i was 30 years old i haven't even been on a lad's holiday i've been to australia you know to play you know, and I'd had a bit of fun, you know, out when I played for St. George, played for East, going to Papua New Guinea. So I'd had an interest in life, but I hadn't just got on a plane with my mates going to yeah. Bali or going to Ibiza or, you know, for a week and coming back. I hadn't done that. That was foreign to me. Really? So I started other things in life, thinking about what am I going to do when I retire? Uh, you know, how much money am I going to have? What, you know, what am I going to do? You know, the, the, what kind of life am I going to have? Thinking about that, you know, there's, there's a lot of sports going to do. And, I'm, and so I, so when I thought so, I've got to start doing other things. That it's more, there's more to life than scoring tries and winning championships. Yeah, you know. So that you know that 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 only because I was at Wigan. You know, I mean, it's, it's going, maybe it's that people with money. It's like if you get a hundred trillion dollars, you know, are you going to still going to be getting up at six o'clock in the morning to go and get another trillion? It's like what's when's enough enough? Yeah, you know? yeah. So that was a yeah. strange, strange time for me. You know, I um. That's the time when I, because up until the time I didn't even drink. I wasn't, you know, people know me. Anyone who know me, you know, you have on podcasts and do me as a youngster. No, I didn't drink. I saw myself as more of an athlete than a rugby player. And I thought to myself, people like Linford and Chris don't drink, so why, why am I drinking? But then I got to a stage I thought, you know, you've got to enjoy your life. You've got to, you know, there are other things in life, you know, having a nice watch, having a nice car, you know, having a family, girls, this, whatever, you know, whatever your vices are. And so I kind of went and say off the rails, but excited experience in the other side of life um, yep. um realized that i wouldn't play this game forever what am i going to do when i retire trying to stay healthy enough to um keep fit because i know that my body is is, is uh, my tool so i need to, to stay in shape but you know there's other things i want to do so you know in my off season I, that's why i stopped going back to back thankfully with super league i couldn't do it anyway but every you know for about t- 10 years, from, I was just either playing in Australia in the off-season or going on tour. Was, as I said, there was no going on there. I was just trying to score tries, trying to create memories, trying to do stuff, you know. And, and even now, it's kind of funny. Like, you know, yeah. someone, you know, in, in, I think in Australia, there's a greyhound named after me. People have got tattoos, you know, with your picture on. And you think, because you've created so many memories of so many different people, it is, but you think about what about you? You know, what what do you what do you want out of your life? What, and, and life is a little bit more balanced now, but because sometimes to succeed, you don't have balance. You just go full throttle ahead. You know, you know, you don't yeah. do it if it kills you, but sometimes it can kill you. And I think the shoulder injury that this occasion I had in um, in '93. You know, I had a little sublux in the season before, but instead of like you know having the season off rehabbing it. I was going to create more memories, trying to score more tries, even though I didn't work out because I only played one game and just get my shoulder, and that was my season out. But you know, sometimes you, you learn as you, you learn as you go. But you know, thankfully, I got my body back together. So having that little bit of time out helped me. You know, also I think in '92, so after I came back from uh, St George in '91, um, I was in dispute with Wigan. So from I think. September to the following January, I was in dispute with the clubs. So I didn't play, so that was a, a bit of time for me to to rehab and get my body together, because I, I found out that um, it's all very well scoring tries for a club, but when you want to leave, they don't want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> the Greece that laid the golden egg. So, 
<laughs> uh, I negotiations and politics, but I just st stuck to my guns and I think I realised that I was such a valuable asset that there's nowhere that they would let me. But they kept saying that I would never play the game again, but thankfully it took a lot of money from from Wigan to get to get me back back in the game again. So that's why I, I just oh you know I can't talk so highly about Wigan enough. You know the town, the people, yeah, the club still work there to this day, and that's why I have such a strong affinity for that place. But as I say, it took such a big thing to get me out of there, and that was Richard Branson. Branson flying me in the helicopter, just totally bamboozling my head, and Frank Warren, who was a boxing promoter. Um, who was um, who bought a rugby club Bedford so I it took two clubs to get me out of Wigan it took Richard yeah. Branson at London Bronx and Frank Warren so Frank Warren and Richard Branson to get me out was Frank. so I was playing for Bedford I signed for Bedford and and London Broncos at the same time right again I was trying to maximise maximise money so yeah so I was only um, uh, contracted to play about eight games for, um, for the London Broncos and it's okay. sort of summer period, and then I played a full season for for Bedford and some rugby union club. So trying to get back right. into the whole rugby union. Yeah. That's, so that's what I did when I left. Um, when I left uh, Wigan, so that it was quite a big thing. You know, Richard Branson, he took, flew me down to his to his house in London. Uh, you know, swine the dime me. This is Richard Branson. I'm talking to him face to face. It's that picture of me and Richard Branson, my to Bromford, and me and me and Frank Warren as well. And I always think to myself, you know, that's what it talked to get me to. And even then, I didn't want to leave, but I just thought, I'm 30. What am I going to do at Wigan? That I've not already done. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, done it all. I've done it all. So, I've done it all. Yeah, man. <laughs> I think I scored 180 something tries in 144 games or something like that. I think I did that twice. Once, similar stats, once at Witness, once yeah. at, at, at Wigan. And I just thought, you know, it's time. It's time to to, to move on and, and think about what what else is there, <laughs> what else is there in life. Even though after I, I left with him, you know, I think I had one season at Bedford. No, was and then I, then then that didn't work out, and I was planning to go back to Wigan again. But uh, yeah, you know, things everything happens for a reason. And I'm glad I did move to London. I'm settled in in, in I live in London now, uh, not not far from where I first moved in 96, probably about. Uh, you know, a mile and a half just down the road in a place called Ealing. Yeah, so yeah, okay. well, it, it was the time. It was the time to leave. But yeah, yeah just playing with those guys with Sean Edwards, and uh, you know, he's a big part of my life, and, and we're we're still close now. And uh, yeah, yeah, love Wigan, <laughs> but you know, it was time. It was the right time to leave. Yeah, and you also had a stint with Salford to finish off your rugby league career, and uh, you know, so how did you how did you cope with going from the highs? of Wigan, where you won everything, you couldn't be stopped, to go into two clubs that, you know, you didn't basically win anything. Like, how, do you, how does that, you know, feel? Yeah, for... we got to the Challenge Cup final in 99. We well, played it in the last Challenge Cup final at the old Wembley Stadium against the Leeds Rhinos. And uh, and we were winning at half-time. And to this day, it's, it's, uh, it's a thing that I will, you know, one of my regrets um, I got a, a dead leg in the first half. We were winning, and a guy called Leroy Vet was playing on the, on the other side. And I just thought I didn't want to be a burden to the team. And so I think I, I scored a try. I think that year I scored, and I think I had another record. I scored in every round of the Challenge Cup, every single round, including the final, final, semi final, quarter final, uh, uh, to the first round. Every single round I scored a try. Amazing. Imagine that. And then my dad died that year as well. So it was a, a special time for me I was, I was playing for him and then I got yeah. a dead leg and it was just it was niggling me I thought I could play and I wasn't quite sure and I was I was going to play and I was not playing and I just thought God, I'm going to come off at half time and I came off at half time the opposite number Lee Roy Rivette went on to score four tries uh, and Leeds Leeds won we lost and then sort of my relationship with London Broncos kind of fell apart they dropped me into the second team and then never played me again and then I left the club, and then they got rid of me at the end of that, that season because my, my contract had really finished. So it kind of really fizzled out. But um, I'm just thinking now, if I had that time again, you know, even with one leg, I probably would have, you know, when you see my likes of Sam Burgess and, and Sean Edwards staying on the pitches with broken jaws, but yeah. you know, all, I, all mine was just a dead leg. But I'm a winger, I'm thinking I can't run. I'm just thinking, how am I going to... I think I stayed on the pitch in 93, 
uh, with concussion. I played, I, you know, and and I probably shouldn't have done. Yeah. And I don't know if that was in my mind, but I, I came off at half time. Yeah. And I, yeah. It was. Um, yeah. Something that I look back on, um, not fondly, but um, you know, it is what it is. You, you know, you've got to live with it. And yeah. uh, not everything is going to be highs. And uh, yeah. And that was the last kind of bit of sunshine I had on, on the career. But then again, I I, I experienced the other side of, of, of the of the coin because on um, at two years at Salford, you know, or my five hundredth, you know, my five yeah, hundredth try at Salford. So Amazing. if I wasn't there, I wouldn't have got to. You know, now exactly. we say, oh, yeah, no, <laughs> there's only three men in the history of the world have scored five hundred. Tri- Tries on the Brian, Be- Brian, Brian Bevan, you know, Boston has scored 570. So it was, that became a thing for me, trying to score more. And even though people say, you haven't scored 500 tries, Martin, because, you know, I'm, I'm tagging in my tries I've scored in the, you know, from East and some of them. Because I was, the rugby league was saying, those tries don't count. I'm saying, you're going to count the tries that Billy Boston scored in 1950 like, when there was no division. So you just played everyone. So that's why they scored so many tries back then. Yeah. Uh, but you're not going to score my. You're not going to consider my hat trick I scored at the Sydney Football Stadium for for in first um, grade. Uh, <laughs> in first grade against the Roost against Eastern Suburbs. That don't count. I couldn't. I couldn't. Couldn't figure that out. All the tries I'd scored for Great Britain, you know, in, in tour, those don't count. What tries someone scored in 1921 against a t- team? When it was unlimited tackles, do you know? I didn't yeah. realize there's nothing. <laughs> I'm saying it's only since 1967 or whatever that the game of rugby league had been a you know six tackle a game. Before then, it was unlimited tackles. So yeah. that's a totally different game. Because I even when I think of Billy Boston, when I think of rugby league played, you know, even in 1905, I think when it was first played in um, you know in Australia and stuff. I still think of it as a game with six tackles. I don't know why. I can't get my head yeah. into the that, that is an unlimited tackle game and what must yep. that game look like. And that's why rugby league was so violent. Because the only way you could get the ball off somebody was to you know, just give them some play. Whack them. Whack them because otherwise they wouldn't drop the ball. Why would you just yeah. keep, keep hold of the ball, crab your way up the pitch and then score, wouldn't it? So you have to take yeah. them. I'm thinking, why would you... If now, even with six tackles, you know, they play... Safety first, and, you know, and kick five drives with a kick or whatever. You know what I mean? And uh, put the bomb up on on the fifth tackle. So he still played yeah. conservatively. You know, so it was unlimited tackle. I think so. So now I think to myself, I think to myself, since the game has been a six tackle game, no one in the world has scored more tries than me in a career. No. Nope. I was thinking that the other day about six o'clock in the morning when I'm reading a book. It's called Rugby League and Thatcher's Britain. I love reading these history books and stuff like that. And um, I think to myself, wow, I did not know that. I'll be 60 next year, and only now, only, I'm 58 now, I'll be 59 uh, at the end of next month. And that's why I like just thinking, I have these moments where I just like wow myself. Because I always think to myself, if you can wow yourself, you can wow other people. That's so why if I score the try, I go, wow. I'm thinking that must make other people go, wow. <laughs> So I think to myself, when I remember all these stats, and I'm thinking, that's going to be crazy. How many people have played rugby league since, you know what I mean? And since it's been a six-tackle game, I'm thinking, oh that, I'm thinking, so since rugby league has been a six-tackle raw game, and I didn't even grow up in the sport of rugby league. I knew nothing <laughs> about the sport. I think no one in the world has probably tried anything. It's like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that is pretty cool, man. <laughs> Oh, you that's a, take that away from you. mate. That's unbelievable. What, a, what an amazing career, man! You're an absolute superstar. You know, I'm, I feel very privileged to speak. You know, I'm a rugby league fanatic. I'm very passionate about the history, the players. You know, to be able to speak to you is, you know, the only person to score 500 tries in the modern era of the game is an absolute privilege. That's just amazing, mate. So, yeah, and so I, I, I usually ask people what their one standout moment is but I think we've pretty well covered that against oh, Leeds yeah, <laughs> I won't ask you that again 
So what I do want to do is I want to finish up with a couple of fun questions that I always ask everyone. Yeah. So um, I'm pretty sure you're going to say you support Wigan as your Super League club, but uh, do you support an NRL side as well? Um, my son is a big Brisbane Broncos fan. He, I'll okay. tell you that he's a big Brisbane Broncos fan, and I think I've always had a bit of a, a bit of a soft spot for the Broncos. Yeah, I've always obviously not when I was playing against them, um, but yeah, just from those early um, uh, Winfield Cup tapes that I used to watch and watch Wally Lewis and uh, uh, you know Alfie Langer, Gene Miles. You know, I just love the whole. I love the story of that they used to yeah. play. You know, you know, in the in the Brisbane comp, and you know that's why I'm a Queenslander. I, no, I, I'm I'm a Maroon through and through. But just, Good man. Just, Good man. Good I, man. I, I, love, I, love, I love the story. I, I think because I played with Del Shearer as well when I watched my first Bet of Origin. But I just love, I just love the stories. You know, what I mean, of the of how you know before it became Bet of Origin. Obviously, you know, Queensland used to get whipped all the time, and you know their their competition was seen as the inferior competition. And you know, up in the Brisbane comp, then just for the success that um, the Queenslanders have had, you know, and that whole Queenslander. So, yeah, I definitely have to say the Broncos. All right, man. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, two non related league questions. Right. Uh, what is your favorite TV show or series of all time? Um, my favorite um, TV show or series of all time. Oh, God. We've got so many. <laughs> oh my god, that, that is a that is a toughie. It's tough. It's that is, tough. <laughs> um ooh, god, that is I want because even when I think of one, I'm just I'm, ooh, I was gonna say friends, and I was still gonna say no. It's the A team. Um Oh, that's God. You could have got me stuff there. A lot of you Brits always come out with Only Fools and Horses. That's a pretty popular one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was thinking at first, but I'm thinking it's probably going to have to be an American TV show. Because, uh, yes. Even though I do love British TV shows, and I've got so many. But, oh, I'm not going to say the 80s. I don't know. That's, you stumped me. We're going. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably say the 80s. All right, mate. Yeah. Okay, this one should be a lot easier. Last question. This should be much easier. If you could only eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? If I could eat only one meal for the rest of my life, I think it would have to be steak and eggs. Too easy. Yeah, that's a pretty Too popular easy, answer. Yeah. I, I, just, I just remember when I first went over to Australia and uh, they, uh, I was uh, playing for Eastern Suburbs, and uh, they let me eat in the in the league club for my um, um for my food every day. At least I have steak and egg every day. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's so like free food at the, at the Roosters League League club every day. You should have steak and eggs. Yeah. It's healthy, food. it's tasty, and you wouldn't get sick of it. Nah, nah, I could eat that every day. Easy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, getting Martin O'Farr on the podcast, it's a real special day for me. So uh, thanks for all the memories, the great tries. You know, you're a great person. Uh, I just really thank you for your time, man. It's been amazing. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks to everyone out there for watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify. Make sure you get on all the platforms, follow Point of Difference Rugby League, and we'll see you all next time. Kick off. Full time.